This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by CuriosityStream. Watch over 2,400 documentaries for free for 31 days at curiositystream.com forward slash real engineering. We've all been there, visiting your local hardware store like a kid in a candy shop. You arrive at the pick and mix screw section and you are just overcome with excitement. How could you possibly pick just one screw? Wow, look at all these screws, amazing. You have sultry slotted screws, playful Phillips. Oh, and look at this one, a hex screw, you naughty polygon. In your excitement, you pick the largest bag you can find and fulfill your childhood dreams to buy two of every kind of screw. Mother can't stop you now. You arrive home with the glee of a spring lamb. Oh, the assembly that awaits, what joy. Then, to your horror, you open your toolbox to discover you only have a fat flathead screwdriver that doesn't even fit the flathead screws you bought. Your life is a lie. You spent your life studying theory and never learned practical application. You are no real engineer. Shh, it's all going to be okay. Dry those existential crisis tears. We are going to learn what all these screws are for and how they came into existence. The humble screw is a technology so old that we cannot easily determine who first invented it. But the answer, as best we can tell, is Archimedes, who used the helical screw's ability to turn rotational motion into linear force to pump water, though he probably stole the idea from the Egyptians. You can imagine how a screw works fairly simply by viewing the cross section at the bottom. This part is essentially a wedge, and when you force a wedge under something, it will lift it up. This wedge shape spirals all the way up the screw, allowing that force to be applied along the full length of the screw. This idea was used for centuries to pump water, dig holes, and for pressing the shit out of grapes to make some wine. Then, some unknown person had a bright idea. If we can apply an opposing force, we could create compression to hold two parts together. And so, someone slapped a head on one of these screws that would press down while the threads pulled upwards, creating an incredibly useful fastener. This idea didn't really take off until a method of mass manufacturing them came about in 1797 when Henry Maudsley invented this metal cutting lathe that allowed for the consistent and precise cutting of screw threads. He even set up a standard screw thread geometry for his machine shop and cut all his nuts and bolts to fit those threads, and thus the chaos started. Several decades of differing standards resulted in headaches far worse than your annoyance at your new phone not fitting your old charging dock. Perhaps the most notable incompatibility occurred during the Great Boston Fire of 1872, when fire departments from neighboring regions arrived to help, only to discover their fire hoses didn't fit Boston's fire hydrants. Most of the world has now accepted isometric threads as a standard, although one country is still holding on to the inch as the standard unit of measurement, a measurement that was legally defined as the length of three grains of barley, dry and round, placed end to end, lengthwise, for eight centuries, until it was redefined as 25.4 millimeters, because as we all know, the best in class is always defined by the second best, but I digress. We can now generally trust that a nut and bolt with the same diameter will fit even when mixing freedom units and metric. But what's the story with all these different screw heads? Why can't we just agree on one shape so we don't need a toolbox full of screwdrivers? The simple slotted screw head was likely the first type used as it's easy and cheap to manufacture with a cutting tool, but is a pretty terrible design for anything other than manual screw driving into wood. Screwdrivers can slip out of the sides and you can turn the screw off its center axis, which causes it to drive into the material at an angle. This was not acceptable for mass production methods, which, as we explored previously, needed a foolproof production method. So, Peter Lindberner Robertson designed a manufacturing process for this square bit screw head, which was designed to be easily and quickly driven home without danger of the screwdriver slipping out and damaging either the screw or the workpiece. 700 of these bad boys were used in the Model T and it saved Henry Ford about two hours of manufacturing time on each and every vehicle. Henry Ford was so happy with the design that he wanted to license it and manufacture them himself to ensure he had a reliable and steady supply of the fastener. But Robertson wasn't about that money making life and said no. He continued doing this with other manufacturers for some bizarre reason and now the design is mostly just used in Canada. And so in stepped Henry F. Phillips with his infuriating screw design. He licensed out the design to Henry Ford and many other people. 
This conical cross design allowed for a single screwdriver to fit many sizes of screws, was self-centering and was designed to cause the screwdriver to slip out of the slot at a certain torque and thus prevent workers from over tightening it and damage the screwdriver or workpiece. It also prevents you from getting the blasted thing out of a workpiece with even the slightest bit of rust. By 1939, this design was licensed to nearly every automotive, airplane and rail manufacturer in the US, just in time for the boom in manufacturing created by World War II. With the Lend-Lease Act, many American designs were sold to their allies and thus the screw design spread even further. Now that most screwdrivers can automatically limit torque, the Phillips design is pretty much just a pain in the ass. So other designs have come to the fore in more recent years, specifically designed to stop that slipping out called cam out, like hex screws and torque screws. Let's compare these two types of screw to see how their design came into existence. These two screws have the same diameter tool. Both have six points of contact between the screw and the tool. However, we can see when we rotate our hex tool, it contacts the screw at a greater radius, allowing it to apply more torque with the same force. But the plane of contact is not perpendicular to the screw, and that means some of the force from the rotation of the screwdriver is applied outwards radially to the screw. This can damage both tools. With the torque screw head, the angle of contact is near perpendicular, meaning it can apply more torque without fear of damaging the screw. But ironically, even though this is a great screw head design, it was designed to not be used by the general populace. It was used in Apple's first personal computer to make it harder for the average guy with a Phillips head screwdriver from opening up the machine. But thanks to its design, torque screws started proliferating and more and more people had the correct tool to loosen it. So someone decided to place a pin in the middle of it to make it even harder bringing us to an age where our right to repair is questioned and many random screw designs have appeared to make it harder for us to take apart our gadgets. Why? Because f you, that's why. If all these nuts are driving you crazy, you might just be a squirrel and being a worldly squirrel, you probably want to learn about all the other types of squirrels around the world. There's ones with wings, ones with cute little ears and tails. Look at this ginger one, class. If you want to learn more about them, I highly recommend watching this documentary titled Going Nuts on Curiosity Stream. It's a beautifully shot documentary that I really enjoyed. For a slightly more on-brand recommendation, they also have an exclusive original documentary series premiering on the 13th of June about the new race to the moon called Return to the Moon. You can watch them for free by signing up to Curiosity Stream using the code REALENGINEERING or using the link in the description. This will give you a month of completely free access to over 2,400 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers. After that first free month, you can continue your access for just $2.99 a month. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, Discord server and subreddit are below.